Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I apologize. I woke up with a cough this morning and tried to get through this talk. But um, I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit closer to human time scales, earthquakes. Probably many people have experienced an earthquake, or if you haven't, you've certainly seen the news reports of large damaging earthquakes that have happened uh, all over the world. And particularly the Tohoku earthquake that happened here five years ago is a, a huge event, and I want to spend some time giving you some of the details uh, what happened, some of the related disaster effects, and, and what we might do in the future to uh, mitigate some of these um, uh, effects. So the, <clears throat> the earthquake was on March 11th, 2011, uh, magnitude 9.0, and it's the largest event that we have in the Japan historical catalog, which is over 1,000 years. Um, over 18,000 lives were killed, economic losses, depending on how you count, are maybe around US $300 billion. If you were in Japan, and the Japanese know this, this really struck home, I think, to a lot of people, the, the scale of this disaster. Uh, one of my colleagues described it as, you know, if a few hundred people had gotten killed, people would have said, seismology and geophysics is very advanced in Japan, and the mitigation and the uh, recovery or the preparations are doing very well. If a thousand people had gotten killed, they probably would have said, well, there's actually very good progress. Um, and an earthquake of this size would have killed many more people in other countries of the world. The fact that tens of thousands of people were killed in Japan, I think, was really a shock. Um, Japanese seismologists, uh, emergency response people were almost at a loss. You know, they've been working so hard over so many years. Why does a disaster of this size still happen in probably the best earthquake prepared country in the world? And, um, and there's a lot of reasons, a lot of complicated reasons, and so I'll go through some of those now. <clears throat> um, this area is, whoops, has a lot of earthquakes, the Tohoku area. Um, in the last 50 years, there's been seven magnitude seven and two magnitude eight. In the last 400 years, 13 magnitude 7, 5 magnitude 8. So very often, very large, very destructive earthquakes. And because of that, seismologists, I think, got a sort of false security that they thought they understood the activity here. You know, when you see so many large earthquakes repeating, then you think, you know, probably it'll continue with that type of activity Probably we understand basically what's happening, and uh, we can go and, and actually calculate probabilities. And so this was done to a very uh, detailed, this whole area was divided up into sections, and probabilities for all these sections were calculated based on a lot of things, historical records, present-day plate rates, uh, present-day observations. So for example, this here, this area off of Miyagi, had a 90% chance of a magnitude seven and a half in the next 30 years. Um, the area off of Fukushima was very low, about 7% in 30 years. And um, so there was very detailed studies, and um, people thought they had a pretty good handle on how often, how large, and the sequence of events that would happen here. So earthquake sources were expected to be around 50 to 150 kilometers in length, and that gives magnitude 7.5 to 8.2, to 8 and occurring at uh, different intervals depending on the, the area you're in and the probability. Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> what did happen was we got a magnitude 9 that broke essentially all of these sections together. So it was sort of a cascade type of event that started in one and then just continued through. And so the whole event just kept on growing. It didn't stop at these segment boundaries that uh, people thought it would. And so it was a magnitude 9 or 9.1 earthquake at a length of about 450 or 500 kilometers long with a, maybe 150 to 200 kilometers. So that was what was unexpected, the size. Um, and magnitude 9 is much bigger than magnitude 8. Um, if you know anything about magnitudes, they're logarithmic. So magnitude 9 is 10 times bigger than a magnitude 8, or 100 times bigger than a magnitude 7. So the fact that a magnitude 9 earthquake 
happened um, was just uh, not a total surprise, but was certainly rather unexpected for this area where a magnitude 9 had not been seen over a history of about 1,000 years. Um, <clears throat> this is sort of the earthquake cycle. Um, you probably know about plate tectonics, where the Pacific plate is going down underneath the Japanese islands. And as it goes down, it drags the upper plate with it. And so over 100 years, 1,000 years, more and more strain is being accumulated until it reaches the breaking point, and it suddenly snaps back. And that's what an earthquake is. It's just that snapping back of the, the upper plate. When it snaps back, obviously the ocean floor moves a lot. And so that's what causes the tsunami, just the deformation of the ocean floor. And the fact that it was a magnitude 9 meant the area was much bigger. The area of slip or the snapback was much bigger than anything that's ever been seen before. Um, the slip was maybe 50 or 60 meters, which is really huge for an earthquake. And so those all contributed to this very large tsunami that, um, that was caused by the earthquake and essentially devastated the northeast coast. It's very easy to see the um, signs of the tsunami. Here's a building near the coast, and you can see the first three stories. The windows and the verandas are all broken, and above that they're not. So the tsunami came at least up to here. And that's about 10 meters. It's probably uh, three or four meters above sea level. So here, the tsunami reached uh, at least 15 meters. And 15 meters is pretty high. If you were to stand there, it's um, actually a little bit hard to conceive that um, the waves are coming in at, at that height. And that certainly wasn't the biggest uh, place. So here's uh, the tsunami survey. And all the way from about Fukushima to northern Miyagi, the wave heights were at least 10 meters, over like 400 kilometers of coast. So a very large area was ex uh, exposed to very large tsunamis. The highest run-ups are 30 to 40 meters, which again is just a huge, huge height for these uh, tsunamis that came in. So it really was a tsunami um, that caused the damage and it was really this unexpected size of the earthquake that caused the unexpected size of the tsunami that did so much damage in this earthquake. Um, OK, so just uh, repeating the earthquake. Expected earthquakes were sort of magnitude 7 to 8, but the magnitude 9 happened. And because it was a magnitude 9, there was this 50 or 60 meter slip on the shallow portion of the fault. And that's what caused this uh, really bad tsunami. So probably one of the most important lessons is that even in an area with many earthquakes, 500 years is still too short. And 500 years seems like a long time in terms of seismology and a lot of earthquakes, but you need more time to see these rare events. And that's something that we heard before. You know, we want to think about you know, these rare events and, and what we want to do. Are they going to happen again? What should we do to to prepare for them. Um, when we think about earthquakes, usually we think about the shaking. And usually it's the shaking that, that does the most damage in an earthquake. And it shook very, very hard in an earthquake. So these red areas have accelerations of about 1G or over, and again, over about four or 500 kilometers. So again, a very large earthquake, a very large area was shaken very hard during this earthquake. Um, these are velocities. Actually, in terms of buildings, they say the velocity is, is uh, more effective in acceleration and, and doing damage. But it's the same story, that um, four or 500 kilometers of coastline was shaken very severely by the, um, by the earthquake, and for a long time. A magnitude 9 has a duration of maybe about a minute. And it probably felt a lot longer than a minute if you were there in this earthquake. <clears throat> but the shaking damage was relatively small. Um, the deaths from collapsed buildings and landslides was only about 4%, so um, less than 1,000 people. And if you could point to something positive from this event, this is one thing that, in general, the buildings did very well in Tohoku. 
Um, this kind of shaking in any other country probably would have produced tens if not hundreds of thousands of deaths um, at, at those kind of really intense shaking. And so if anything um, that we can say good about the earthquake or good about the preparation is that the building standards did relatively well and that not so many people were killed. And, and the reason, again, is simply because they have a lot of earthquakes there. Uh, every time you get an earthquake, it essentially takes out all the bad buildings. And if you rebuild to a higher standard, then eventually you just improve the, um, uh, the building stock. It's a kind of a natural selection process that happens there. Um, and um, uh, we've heard a lot about the nuclear power plant. I don't want to spend too much time on there, but I just want to make one point, and that is um, the shaking damage uh, we don't know because there's nothing much left, but apparently it was not the shaking damage that destroyed or damaged the power plants. That they were designed for the shaking that happened and that the structures did, did perform well. The problem was that the power went out and a lot of the backup power supplies were close to the shore and so the tsunamis took out the backward backup power supplies and so the uh, nuclear power plants overheated. And so that was an uh, error in judgment um, but it was not because of the shaking, which is what most people are really worried about in terms of uh, nuclear power plants. And, and just an example, uh, there were four nuclear power plants along the coast. Fukushima Daiichi is the one that had uh, the meltdown. Uh, Onaga, Onagawa actually was closer and was shaken much more strongly, but did not have the same problem simply because they could return the power. Uh, the backup, the power did go out but they were able to restore power and so the cooling systems work. So um, just like to make the point that it wasn't because of the earthquake shaking that caused the, um, uh, the disasters at the nuclear power plants. Okay, back to the tsunami. Um, uh, I always ask my students this question. You've seen a lot of video and uh, the tsunami. So how fast do you think the tsunami comes? Do you think it comes at the speed of a car or the bullet train or jet airliner? or seismic waves. And of course, this is important because we want to talk about the tsunami warnings. Um, I won't ask you that question, but uh, the answer, excuse me, the answer is um, close to shore where the, sorry, where the water depths are shallow, um, they're traveling maybe 40 to 80 kilometers per hour, and maybe even more slowly in five or 10 meters of water. Offshore, 100 kilometers offshore, they're traveling two or three hundred kilometers an hour. So if you see it coming, you still have a chance to get away if you can run very fast or if you have a bicycle or a, a car. Um, and it's coming much faster offshore, but you can't see it at that point. But anyways, the point is that um, you do have, not a lot, but you do have a fair amount of time uh, between when the earthquake happens and the tsunami arrives, especially if you have good information when the earthquake happens. And there was good information. So um, the tsunami warnings were issued at 1446, three minutes after the earthquake origin time. Um, the initial magnitude was a little bit off, it was a little bit low, but there were updates sort of 10 or 15 minutes later that gave the uh, uh, correct magnitudes. So here's several sites, um, especially look at these where some of the bigger tsunamis came and the arrival times. So even at the closest one, I guess is this one, there was, see, I can't see, there was still 35 minutes, over half an hour. Here, 38 minutes, 43, 43, 68, over an hour. So um, even at the close sites, there was um, a fair amount of time if you had reacted very quickly to the tsunami warning to get away. And usually you don't have to go very far. Um, usually there's evacuation sites um, designated and you just have to get, you know, 40 or 50 meters up a hill or something to get away. If you're on flat land, it may be a little more difficult, but, but generally this um, amount of time should have been enough for most people to get away from the tsunami. Um, so this is actually a, a big, big problem or a big issue. So the tsunamis were much larger than expected. Um, they were over 30 meters 
in some places. And there's lots of uh, tsunami gates and walls all over the uh, area. But most of those are only about 10 to 15 meters. And those would have been OK if it was a magnitude 8 earthquake. But again, because this was much larger than expected, these uh, tsunami gates were, um, uh, were, were, were too, too low. So I think I have a, OK, so here's, here's a picture of um, one. This is probably, what, about uh, 2 meters and a few meters above sea level. So this is probably about 9 meters or so here. And this is the site where you probably see a lot of photographs where the, they have of the tsunami coming over the top of the wall in, in Miyake uh, City. Some of those tsunami walls were actually broken by the, the force of them. Um, <clears throat> but it's still uh, a real issue, a real problem, why people did not leave faster. If everyone had dropped everything they were doing and immediately tried to get to higher ground, there probably would have been very few deaths. Um, you know, half an hour, you can get pretty far, even at walking speed, in half an hour. And it's very ironic, because probably the Toho area is the best educated area in the world for tsunami hazards. They've had a long history in um, school. All the children are taught what to do. There's well-marked evacuation points. If you drive in the area, you see lots of signs. And so it's a real, real problem or real uh, issue is, you know, why didn't people just drop everything they do and go away? One possible explanation is that there was this false security from all these walls. And again, if you go there and you see these walls, they're pretty high. And it's kind of hard to imagine if you're standing on a sunny day that the, the waves are going to come over, over the top. And so that probably worked against um, the situation at this particular one. Another thing that's kind of interesting is that two days before the earthquake, there was a foreshock, about 7.3. Still pretty big, still shook the area. Everyone felt it. A tsunami warning went out, as usual. A tsunami came, but it was only about 40 centimeters high. And some people say that maybe that sort of caused some compl complacency, that people just a couple days before had experienced shaking, had seen the tsunami warnings, and um, had saw a very small tsunami and figured that, well, we have the walls, and, and maybe that was, again, something that worked, worked, against, uh, um, worked, worked against them in the earthquake. Um, another thing is that the earthquake the warning went out in three minutes, and that was sort of magnitude 7.9, but that warning was sort of, it's dangerous and you should leave, but then a much larger warning came out about five minutes later saying, it's really dangerous, you should really leave fast. But uh, probably most people just reacted or listened to the first warning. Also, the power went out very quickly, and so probably a lot of people didn't, didn't hear the second warning. So, there's a lot of, lot of issues, a lot of complications, and um, those sociological reasons are being, being uh, studied now. But again, it's, it's, it's just rather sad um, that this area really was very well prepared. But there were just sort of sequence of events that um, uh, still caused that 15 or 18,000 people to be killed by the earthquake. Um, okay, so that's, that's basically what I want to say. Um, first lesson is that for geological hazards, 500 years is certainly not long enough. And we've been hearing that. Um, solar flares, floods, the 1,000-year flood, volcanoes that erupt every 10,000 years. Um, geological hazards are difficult to evaluate. And just because it's never occurred before does not mean it's not going to happen tomorrow. The technology of the warning system worked very well. The tsunami warnings went out within three minutes. I didn't talk about it. There's also an early warning system in operation, and that went out sort of within a few tens of seconds to Tokyo and other areas. So um, the technical warning systems in Japan are designed uh, very, very well, very resilient, and worked very well and very fast. Um, but again, it was sort of the response that um, that caused the problem. And one, one, code, one thing we always say is building codes are, 
probably one of the most effective ways to, to save lives. You know, don't try to expect the early warning or expect that you're going to get told of the earthquake beforehand, but just build your, your, your uh, building strongly. And that certainly paid off for uh, the Toho area. Um, just one last comment. So we've been hearing this several times. Uh, Professor Yamashiki mentioned it quite a few times. You know, what do we do for a, a rare uh, or extreme event? I mean, probably another M9 is not going to happen in Japan in our lifetime, or even our children's lifetime. So how do we plan our education and hazard mitigation efforts that are going to span generations? Um, we have to have lasting programs that don't depend on someone remembering what happened in the last earthquake. Um, what are the practical strategies for rebuilding? Uh, we could build 30 meter walls along the coastline, but I don't think anyone would think that's a very reasonable type of solution. But um, these are the kind of problems that we really need to look at um, for the rare, you know, once every thousand or few thousand year event that is going to be very large, but we ourselves probably aren't going to see that. And I think that's a real challenge for especially the seismic and the volcanic uh, hazard mitigation efforts. So I'll stop there.